So I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, it's a few minutes after noon. Um, so my topic today is on diabetes management um, and some of the potentially newer agents that we have available as well as some of the technology that um, we have available now and things in the pipeline as well. Um, I have no disclosures. Um, so as I mentioned, um, a couple of newer agents have been FDA approved for treatment of diabetes. Can, can you hear me? Move it up. Little, oh, my hair? <laughs> my hair, okay. Okay, can you guys hear me? <laughs> Um, so, uh, we'll also talk about, um, like I mentioned, some of the technology that's currently available as well as um, things that may be coming um, in the near future um, for management of diabetes. Um, and then we'll talk about also uh, potential alternate site uh, testing of glucose um, and maybe using things that don't include um, you know, extracting blood from the finger. So as we all know, um, diabetes in the U United States is a prevalent problem with over 29 million Americans having diabetes. Um, one in four people don't even know that they have diabetes, so they're unrecognized, undiagnosed uh, diabetes. And um, certain ethnic populations are at higher risk, um, and including those that we see you know, here in the South and in Louisiana. Um, such as, uh, let me find my pointer here, you know, non-Hispanic uh, African Americans, Hispanics, and even some Asian Americans that we see, you know, in our patient population um, compared to their non-Hispanic uh, white counterparts. Um, as you all know, uh, um, the American Diabetes Association classifies diabetes into four main categories. So this includes type 1 diabetes, which is due to beta cell destruction, uh, which leads to absolute insulin deficiency. And this comprises of about uh, 5 to 10 percent of diabetes patients. Uh, type 2 diabetes is a progressive insulin secretory defect on the background of insulin resistance, which is the most common type of diabetes that we see, um, up to about 95 percent of diabetes patients. Um, gestational diabetes. Um, <coughs> is sort of the third category, and it's diagnosed in the second and third trimester of pregnancy. And um, by definition, it's um, not clearly overt pre-gestational diabetes. So if someone or a woman is uh, diagnosed with diabetes in the first trimester, then she has um, unrecognized or undiagnosed uh, pre-gestational diabetes. And then the fourth category here um, is sort of everything else. Um, including endocrinopathies, uh, including monogenic diabetes, um, diseases of the exocrine pancreas like cystic fibrosis related diabetes, um, as well as drug or chemically induced diabetes such as uh, steroid induced diabetes that we uh, most commonly think of. So, you know, one of the first steps in diagnosis of diabetes is identifying the type of diabetes someone has. Um, because, you know, the most common types we come across are type 1 and type 2. Of course, with type 2 being the most common, but it may not always be obvious on presentation. Um, everybody seems to be a little over overweight and obese, at least in our patient population. And so when they first present, you know, the question that we often ask ourselves is, what type of diabetes do you have? Um, and there's a Stanford University group that's uh, created this plasmonic gold chip using uh, near-infrared fluorescence enhanced detection of violet cell um, targeting autoantibodies to help distinguish type 1 from type 2 diabetes um, in a speedier way. Um, so in their sort of um, plasmonic chip, they're requiring a drop of blood, so like a finger stick um, drop of blood, and with the idea that the results finalize quickly. Um, currently, we do have um, antibodies that we can send off to check for, you know, um, and those we suspect of type 1 diabetes, except that the results take a good solid two weeks to come back, and by that time, patients are often discharged from the hospital if they were uh, initially diagnosed um, during hospitalization. So the chip and corresponding reader are still in development, and they're planning clinical trials to uh, test the accuracy of this. Um, the company 
uh, IGI STAT that started by the Stanford researchers. You know, they hope to see the device in hospitals within two years. Um, I doubt that'll happen given sort of FDA rules and regulations, but, um, but that's something that may be coming down the pipeline that might help us um, diagnose patients more accurately. So this is here in the top right panel here, this table is comparing the, their gold plasmonic chip with um, sort of the usual standard radio amino assay um, method of checking for autoantibodies in people with type 1 diabetes. And it has comparable, um, you know, data as far as sensitivity and specificity. Um, so it's pretty comparable for as far as, you know, the standard methods we have now um, with the, um, the advantage of being quicker as far as the results. Um, and this is just a schematic that depicts sort of the, this chip. Um, it has this plasmonic gold substrate with this um, polyethylene glycol layer um, with the antigen um, and primary um, autoantibodies from diluted human sera here um, and the detection of the antibodies conjugated with the fluorospheal signal here that you see. So identification of an individual's type of diabetes early in the diagnosis helps us as medical professionals in the management of diabetes, right? Someone has type 1 diabetes, then we want to put them on exogenous insulin basal bolus therapy um, compared to somebody who has type 2 diabetes who may not necessarily need exogenous insulin. And so early accurate uh, etiology recognition of diabetes can help prevent uh, potential hyperglycemic crises that can occur if we're not correctly diagnosing people um, with type 1. So we're presuming they have type 2 because it's the most common type of diabetes we come across and then they come back in a couple weeks later perhaps with a hyperglycemic emergency. Um, but that's really, you know, only the first hurdle in management of diabetes, as you all well know. And optimizing glycemic management so that patients meet glycemic targets safely um, to minimize future, future complications is also important. Uh, so the question is, how well are we doing overall as far as meeting glycemic targets? Um, so this is data, uh, NHANES data, um, looking at not just glycemic targets um, using A1C as a marker, but also other metabolic targets like blood pressure, um, LDL goals among people with diabetes between uh, 88 and 2010, um, and just focusing on um, A1C targets and how well we've done. So between 88, and they've sort of partitioned this off into blocks of time, so 88 to 94, 99 to 2002, 2003 to 2006, and 2007 to 2010. And over the blocks of time, we've been improving um, A1C control uh, and targets. To, so an A1C of less than 7%, um, we've most currently achieved about a little over 50% of patients. Um, and those achieving an A1C of less than 8%, a little over 75% of patients, which is improved, um, as you can see, between you know, 1988 to 94, um, and here also for the less than 7% um, A1C. Um, combining um, all the metabolic targets here, we're kind of doing less well overall with a little less than 20% of patients, um, most currently achieving all three targets. Um, and of course, now we've moved away from LDL targets with our uh, statin treatments. Um, but this is better than when we started between, you know, 1988 to 94, where we really weren't doing that well at all as far as reaching targets. But it's also important to look at, you know, what the breakdown is. Who which group of patients are actually achieving these targets. Um, and so if you look here, so the group achieving the highest percentage of an A1C of less than 7% and less than 8% respectively are those who are actually older, so 75 years or older. Um, and younger individuals, so those younger than 50, as you can see here, they have the least percentage of achieving an A1C goal of less than 7% um, and also less than 8%, um, which is, a little concerning. I mean, we don't have the breakdown of, you know, the rates of hypoglycemia in these patients, what individual agents that they're on, but 
generally, um, we are a little less stringent with our older patients um, because we really don't want to harm them with hypoglycemia and potentially other side effects um, in order to achieve a really tight A1C control because the, the point of A1C control is to prevent long-term complications. And if they're 75 or 80, you know, their life expectancy isn't gonna be 20, 30, 40 years. As opposed to our younger patients where we do wanna achieve you know, tighter A1C control early on in their life so that they can live you know, complication-free, optimistically, for the next 40 to 50 years. So blood glucose monitoring is important in, um, and an integral part of diabetes management, particularly for those on insulin therapy, so that you can uh, detect times of hypoglycemia as well as hyperglycemia. And so more frequent glucose monitoring in those on insulin therapy um, has been related to better glycemic control. Um, the problem is that finger stick glucose monitoring isn't always easy. Um, finger stick monitoring may be painful. You have to remember to check you know, multiple times a day, um, and that takes time. Um, generally, people have to break away and you know, check their blood sugar. Um, and you also have to remember to carry the supplies with you. You have to remember to bring the meter, you have to remember the test strips, you have to remember the lancets, um, the alcohol swabs, and checking may be a bit messy as well. Um, I've included just a picture of a diabetes you know, log book here with a few blood smears on it. So, um, you know, at least you know that this person is checking and their data is real, as opposed to the person who comes in with this pristine sheet and very pretty numbers and you start to suspect, well, are you even really checking? Um, because it can be a bit messy when you actually check your numbers or in, and are keeping a log book. Um, there have been changes over the years, and certainly, you know, we've made strides in um, improving the current um, glucose monitoring that we have with the glucometers. Um, we have smaller gauge lens sets, so with the idea that it's less painful to check, um, but it does still require blood. Um, meters um, provide faster results as well um, in seconds rather than waiting, you know, minutes or um, when the first meter came out, it was well, quite a long time to get an actual result. Uh, Landsat devices are also offering uh, alternate site testing, including the forearm, the palm, and the thigh, but it still requires lancetting um, your skin, so it does still require blood. What if there were ways to minimize the time even for um, further for, for glucose monitoring so that you know, we don't have to um, pull out an individual test strip and put it in and code the meter and you know, change out your lancet. So all of this takes time. And what if the lancet devices weren't even needed for glucose monitoring? What if we could use other sites and fluids to assess for um, the blood glucose level? So currently, um, AccuCheck is um, one of the main sort of uh, makers of glucometers. And they have a couple of systems available. One that's available in the US is the compact system. Um, and this meter uses a load and go drum and it has 17 preloaded test strips so that you don't have to sort of struggle with pulling out individual test strips. And there's no coding as well, which um, means fewer steps in checking your blood glucose level. Um, mobile system, which is similar to compact, is only available in Europe. And it has a 50 strip continuous tape, again, with the idea that you don't have to handle individual test strips, um, which can potentially minimize some of the time it takes to check and increases the convenience. It also includes a, a six lens sets um, and a drum, so you don't have to change out individual lens sets every time you want to check. Um, so you just change out the drum um, once you're done with those six uh, lens sets. And minimizing time and testing is important, but these systems still require some amount of time and, um, again, blood sample. So we do have continuous glucose monitoring systems um, that are currently available, and CGMS provides many more glucose data points um, and helps us in identifying hypoglycemia patterns, um, particularly overnight when people are most vulnerable, um, as well as unrecognized hyperglycemia that may be occurring 
and that can help explain A1C levels because A1C doesn't give us, um, you know, t specific time points, but rather an average over three months. Um, however, for the current FDA-approved CGMS, finger stick calibration is still required um, for uh, for the system and interventions for uh, glucose levels, so either hyper or hypoglycemia, shouldn't be based on the CGMS, and actually they don't recommend that you use the CGMS to make any interventions, but rather you should confirm with the finger stick glucose. So if the CGMS is saying your blood glucose is 50, you should still check with the meter um, to confirm that it's actually 50 before you treat. Or if it's saying your blood sugar is 250, again, you should confirm with the meter um, before actually um, giving additional insulin to correct the hyperglycemia. Also, the CGMS sensors generally need to be changed every six to seven days, depending on um, which one you use. And the insertion and placement of the sensor can be painful um, because there is an introducer needle for the placement. Um, certain medications can interfere with the readings. Um, most commonly, acetaminophen or vitamin C um, can cause erroneously um, high readings. And so, again, that's why they recommend you not um, intervening um, on a low or high sugar based on the CGMS. But at least it does give us more data points. Um, and potentially someone who checks very frequently, say 10 times a day, would be able to um, cut back on the amount of uh, monitoring that they do as far as finger stick monitoring. So there is a CGMS available, Abbott Freestyle Libre Flash, um, in Europe not in the U.S. Uh, currently. Um, and again, this device is a Clinch's glucose monitoring system that has a water resistance sensor and a reader device that copies and displays the readings from the sensor. It does not require a finger <coughs> stick calibration, which is something that's new. Um, and they do say, however, that you should check a finger stick um, blood glucose level when your hypoglycemic, so the reading is showing that you're low, or when the glucose is rapidly changing. So maybe after you've eaten or if you're exercising and you're running and your blood glucose level might be dropping, or you have symptoms that really don't correlate with your um, reading. So you feel hypoglycemic, but the, uh, the CGMS is saying that your glucose is normal. This sensor can be worn for up to 14 days and records blood glucose levels every minute. So again, gives us a lot of amounts of data as far as the glucose. Um, and the sampling is done through this filament that penetrates the skin. So there is some form of needle that is um, you know, needed for the initial sort of insertion and startup of the sensor. But at least it can be worn for longer. And this picture here just shows the sensor here and the uh, reader device. So once started, um, or once inserted, you start up the 14-day sensor by tapping the start sensor on the, the touch screen, shown here on the right side, and you hold the reader within an inch and a half of the sensor to scan it. Um, and after about 60 minutes, you know, kind of countdown warm-up time, the, syst the system gives real-time glucose values and trends data for up to 90 days of information. Um, again, this is only available in Europe, but there is a one-time startup cost for the, the reader, the touchscreen reader here, um, as well as the sensors. And the sensors, as you can see, can be a bit pricey, about maybe $75 um, as far as U.S. dollars for each 14-day <coughs> sensor. Um, at this point, as far as for the U.S. and if we may potentially be getting this, um, Abbott has completed some accuracy studies um, and in March, uh, just a couple of months ago, and so um, they'll be presenting this to the FDA and seeing as far as, you know, if there will be FDA approval. But, you know, this potentially is something that might help improve adherence to glucose monitoring in our patients. So, Things that are, well, this is a Google Smart Lens technology, and this is currently not available, but something that's been in the news um, with the idea that it's built to measure glucose levels in tiers via a tiny wireless chip and miniaturized glucose sensor embedded between two layers of soft contact lens material. 
So Google has partnered with Novartis, which is a, a major pharmaceutical company, um, and they are, they've made various diabetes products. Um, and the idea is that the information about the blood glucose levels could be uploaded to a smartphone device and you could monitor the data um, almost in real time. And I say almost in real time because there will be some lag, probably 10 to 15 minutes um, as far as the actual um, glucose numbers. There's not a whole lot of, I guess, more technical information out there. They've been more hush-hush about it. Um, but this has been um, something that you know has gotten people excited as far as an alternate way to monitor glucose. So I looked in the literature to see, well, what else is out there as far as sort of this concept of contact lens and glucose sensing and monitoring. Um, and there have been a few um, publications about sort of the idea of a miniature biofuel cell um, as a glucose sensing contact lens um, with the idea that it's a membraneless, membraneless biofuel cell that's capable of generating an electric, um, electrical energy from tears, essentially, and would potentially be a source for measuring um, glucose levels via contact lens. Again, this is, you know, not something we're going to see next year, but something in the works that might be um, certainly less invasive than finger stick monitoring. What else is potentially out there? Um, there's, there's been this proof of concept um, study looking at tattoo-based, not an invasive glucose monitoring um, with the idea that, um, well, this is a schematic display of this digital tattoo. So essentially you have this sort of printable paper tattoo um, with these electrodes and then this green area here um, is this transparent insulating layer and then there's this hydrogel layer. Um, and so to check the blood glucose level or the glucose level, so technically blood glucose, but the glucose level, the electrodes apply a mild electrical current to the skin for about 10 minutes. Um, and the sensor in the tattoo measures the strength of the electrical charge produced by the glucose in the interstitial fluid. Um, so CGMS therapy measures uh, glucose in the interstitial fluid, so this is kind of using that idea, but without actually piercing the skin in any way. Um, and the idea is that it would be removable and you could pull it off after a certain amount of time. So besides blood glucose monitoring, um, obviously there are other aspects of diabetes management, um, like adherence to prescribed diabetes therapies, um, that are important in people achieving um, glycemic control. People often forget to take their medications. Um, at least we have pill boxes for oral medications, uh, but what about insulin therapies or maybe some of the other non-insulin injectable therapies like GLP-1 receptor agonists? Um, it's kind of hard to fit that in a pill box and say, oh, I took my insulin already. So um, there are some, or there's at least one currently um, tool that we could potentially use. Um, so Timesulin is a digital reader that displays how long it's been since the insulin pen was uncapped. Um, the idea is that you snap this Timesulin cap on your insulin pen and it starts um, sort of a countdown or a timer that starts and uh, as soon as you put the insulin pen um, cap back on. So it replaces your insulin pen cap that you usually have. Um, it works with most major pen brands and it is currently available. Um, and you, this is just a screenshot of you know, kind of how it looks when you try to order this, but um, you pick what type of insulin pen you have and it obviously only works with insulin pens and not insulin vials. Um, and this is sort of the closer look at the, sort of the timer on the time saloon insulin pen cap. So GoCap is something that's not currently available, but um, you know the idea is wouldn't it be even better if you could track the amount of insulin that you took um, as well as the time you injected rather than when was the last time I injected, or at least when was the last time I uncapped the insulin pen. So GoCap was developed as a concept as part of the 2013 uh, Data Design Diabetes 
um, which is a Sanofi um, innovation challenge. Um, and Sanofi is a pharmaceutical company that, um, again, makes all many diabetes products. So the idea is that GoCap, which is, would, they're calling it a smart cap, um, would replace the, the, again, the cap on insulin pens, and it would track the amount of insulin um, amounts as well as the times that the insulin was taken. Um, and the idea is that it wirelessly connects with a smartphone, or you can also, and or, connect it to a glucometer via Bluetooth um, with a display that would show similarly to this, where you took, you know, you took your insulin of 16 units at 7.23 p.m. Um, this is your blood glucose level. Um, and Again, this is more of a, a concept of um, uh, trying to increase the adherence of, of um, patient insulin taking as well as um, safety purposes, but this is not currently available. Consistent carbohydrate intake is something we talk to patients about um, who have diabetes, um, how it's important to have consistent mealtime intake of carbohydrates as well as fat and protein. Um, and try to eat at consistent times of day as well. Um, consistency with meal intake can be really difficult. I mean, we all, you know, have a job, and so we can't really revolve our life around meals, and so most people can't do that. Um, and if you don't eat the same thing every day at the same time, um, which is pretty hard to do, um, then you're going to get a fluctuation in your blood glucose level, particularly if you have type 1 diabetes. Um, where you're on multiple daily injections of insulin. So we have apps currently that can help us with uh, standardized nutritional information um, so patients can perform more accurate carbohydrate counting. Um, and you know, there are a lot of apps out there, more than 1,100 apps that are available for people with diabetes that can track things like um, insulin, exercise, carbohydrate intake, cookbooks, um, weight, BMI, uh, so lots out there, but I just sort of highlighted a few. Um, glucose Buddy is one that can track uh, glucose readings, trend highs, lows, averages, graph it all out. Um, it can give you push notifications, which essentially is like, hey, you haven't inputted any data for blood glucose level today. Um, medication log. Uh, Calorie King, um, it's similar to the book that's available, but there's much more data as far as on the app. Um, but can give you nutritional information like carbohydrate data for people who carb count um, and for generic foods as well as for restaurants. Uh, Fitter Fitness Calculator is a personal daily weight tracker. Um, can track weight goals, weight loss up to the present date so you can set like how much weight you want to lose over a certain period of time and it'll track that. Um, body mass index, body fat percentage. Um, and then Go Meals is an app with nutritional data, including carbohydrates, specifically for uh, restaurants. So these can be tools for people with diabetes to use. Currently, though, there's no way to obtain sort of real-time information for food that we're eating. Um, it would be nice to have some sort of food scanner to actually get real-time information. There is a Canadian company um, called Telspec that's sort of working on creating a food scanner that gives ingredients and nutritional information, including carbohydrates. And the idea of this system is that it has, there's a scanner um, shown here, um, and you have a smartphone. Um, and there's a database which exists on, the, on their cloud with proprietary algorithms that's sort of owned by Telspec. Um, and the idea is that the scanner is a spectrometer that emits light um, at the food and it counts the photons that's reflected back. And then there's a spectrograph that's created, which is unique to each food. And again, based on their proprietary algorithm, um, it sort of processes this information and sends the um, information back to the smartphone. Um, here with the idea that you would see something like this as far as the ingredients and the grams of carbs and the fats and protein. Um, this is not currently available, but something that this company has been working on. Hypoglycemia um, is an undesirable effect, uh, side effect of insulin therapy and other um, diabetes medications and can be a barrier to optimizing glycemic control. In 2011, 
almost 300,000 emergency visits for adults um, 18 years or older were for hypoglycemia related to diabetes. Uh, newer technology is available that helps us to prevent hypoglycemia um, as well as curb um, hyperglycemia, like the CGMS therapy that I talked about. Also, insulin pump therapies are available that can help um, minimize this um, in conjunction with CGMS. Um, and these combined systems, there is um, one system that has a threshold suspend feature on the insulin pump when hypoglycemia is detected, particularly overnight, again, when people are more vulnerable to hypoglycemia. So this is um, the animus pump that combines the insulin pump with CGMS therapy, um, and it was a newer pump that's been approved in November of 2014 by the FDA. Um, it's the Animus Vibe system that con consists of the Animus Vibe insulin pump, and it's uh, paired with the Dexcom G4 platinum sensor. So both the pump and the CGM have been available but not combined like this. Um, at this time, though, there is no auto-suspend feature for this pump, um, but they're looking at incorporating this feature. Um, the other sort of major insulin pump maker is Medtronic, and they actually do have a pump that has a threshold suspend uh, feature to it. Um, the Medtronic Minimed 530G with in-light sensor was approved in 2013, and it's currently the only FDA device that suspends insulin delivery in response to CGMS data. There's automatic suspension of insulin delivery for up to two hours when a preset sensor glucose threshold is reached. So for example, if the sensor detects that your glucose is below 70, because you've set the lower limit as 70 as the threshold to spend, um, then it'll shut off the pump for two hours and then restart after that based on the continuous glucose monitoring sensor data. And so this has the potential to mitigate hypoglycemia, uh, again, particularly overnight. The suspension can be manually overridden. So if the individual is awake, um, they can say, oh, my glucose must be low because my sensor, my CGMS is alarming. Let me check my glucose and treat appropriately. And then they can um, shut off the auto suspend um, because they're awake and they're treating their hypoglycemia. So a trial on this the ASPIRE trial, um, Automation to Simulate Pancreatic Insulin Response, um, was a randomized controlled multicenter open label trial that looked at the effects of the threshold suspend feature with sensor augmented insulin pump therapy versus um, sensor augmented pump therapy without this suspend feature. And they looked at effects on A1C. Uh, nocturnal hypoglycemia, particularly in those patients who had documented nocturnal hypoglycemia. Um, and these patients were 16 to 70 years old with uh, type 1 diabetes for at least two years. And so uh, what they found was that over a three-month period, the use of the sensor augmented pump therapy with the threshold suspend feature decreased um, overnight hypoglycemia without increasing the A1C values. So control and study, as you see here. So the control A1C um, at randomization was 7.2. Um, and at the end uh, of three months, their A1C was 7.1. So um, better A1C. Um, with the um, study group, their starting A1C at randomization was 7.26. And really, there wasn't much of a change in their A1C at three months with this um, auto suspend feature, threshold suspend feature. But looking at the rates of nocturnal hypoglycemia, this first top panel here, so this is the run in phase in this darker blue, and then steady phase in the lighter blue. And this is the threshold suspend group here on the left side and the control group on the right side. And you can see that there was a 38% reduction in um, nocturnal hypoglycemia rates in those with the using the threshold suspend pump um, compared to the control group. And again, their A1C really didn't change a whole lot, um, but you were able to eliminate sort of the dangerous hypoglycemia episodes. 
And this sort of just serves to reiterate that. Um, again, this looks at specifically nocturnal hypoglycemia versus combined um, daytime and nighttime hypoglycemia. Um, and it looked like a lot more of the hypoglycemia was occurring at night, overnight. Um, and there was a decrease in the threshold suspend group compared to the control group, particularly for the more severe hypoglycemia, less than 50 milligrams per deciliter. Um, again, compared to the day and night combined. And this um, graph here just shows how it works as far as, you know, it suspends for two hours and the rise isn't particularly um, high. I mean, it's not like people rebound up into the 300s. This here is 150 and they trend down. The um, insulin is suspended in the insulin pump and they tend to rise back up to about the 150 range. So it's not, um, terrible hypo, hyperglycemia that occurs afterwards that keeps them out of trouble as far as, um, you know, more severe hypoglycemia. So the bionic pancreas is something that's been looked at and been um, presented at uh, some of the various endocrine conferences. Um, it's, so Russell et al., um, it's a group in Massachusetts that They've looked at an autonomous, wearable, bihormonal bionic pancreas in adults and adolescents in the ambulatory setting. And the two hormones that they use are insulin and the counter-regulatory hormone glucagon. Um, patients were ages 12 to 75 years old, and they defined the adolescent group as 12 to 20 years old, and the adult group as 21 to 75 years old. Um, they had a total of 52 participants, and these are all type 1 patients with type 1 diabetes for at least a year. And this was a random order crossover design with the pancreat, bionic pancreas for five days and then sort of their patient's usual pump therapy for five days. So you either started with the bionic pancreas or you started with your own and then you flipped over. So these were sort of the components of the bionic pancreas. Um, it was an iPhone 4S that ran the control algorithm. There was a Dexcom G4 Platinum um, continuous glucose monitoring system, as you see here, and it was connected by a custom hardware interface with the iPhone. Um, the tandem T-Slim insulin pump was used for both the insulin and the glucagon, so they had to, each participant had to wear two insulin pumps um, when they were wearing the bionic pancreas, um, as well as you know, carry the iPhone and have the uh, Dexcom CGMS. Um, and then insulin dosing was initialized with the patient's weight and the algorithm automatically adapted based on initial information um, given on sort of day one that was entered by the wearer of the this bionic pancreas. So they would say, you know, they would enter in their weight and then they would say, I'm gonna have a sort of a normal size meal I'm going to have a small meal or I'm going to have a big meal. And um, the algorithm would sort of take this in information in. And then after that, after that initial day, there really wasn't much in the way of um, human input. And so this was sort of the data that they collected. Um, a little bit busy, but um, so the black line in the black shaded area is the bionic pancreas and this sort of reddish color is the control. Um, the mean glucose for the adults up here in panel A was 137 milligrams per deciliter for the bionic pancreas um, compared to the mean glucose when they were on their usual pump um, therapy. Um, the mean glucose was 158 milligrams per deciliter. And as you can see here, so this was sort of the mean and then the standard deviation is sort of the shaded area. Um, and overall, kind of after the initial first day, there's sort of less um, hyper and potentially hypoglycemic variation um, in the bionic pancreas in adults compared to that of the control, um, particularly for the hyperglycemia, as you see kind of in these shaded areas. Uh, the same holds true for the um, adolescents as well. They also had sort of improvement in their mean glucose with curbing of the hyperglycemia as well as potentially hypoglycemia. And this just serves to show that um, in a different way. Um, so for the adults, you know, they were able to achieve an A1C of less than 7%. Um, 
and in the adolescents as well, their target was a little bit higher because they're adolescents and so their targets are a little bit different, but they were also able to achieve A1C of 7.5% 7 or less except for one person here. And they did show that with this automated bionic pancreas, it improved the mean glycemic levels with less frequent hypoglycemic episodes overall in both adults and adolescents with type 1 diabetes compared to kind of usual insulin pump therapy. So moving on to kind of the next um, topic, uh, inhaled insulin therapies. Um, so the first studies looking at inha inhaled insulin um, dates back to about 1924 um, and obviously now sort of, you know, 90 years later. <laughs> um, we have a newer uh, insulin, inhaled insulin therapy that's available. The first FDA approved inhaled insulin product was in 2006 with Exubera. Some of you may remember this, um, but it was a dry powder uh, insulin product, um, kind of shown here on the right. This was the device with these insulin uh, blisters, um, and this is showing someone using it. So as you can tell, it's not really the smallest of devices and maybe a little awkward to carry around. Um, and Pfizer, the manufacturer of Exubra, um, essentially stopped production and marketing because it really wasn't that well received in, um, or by patients or uh, healthcare providers. So despite this, um, Mankind Corporation, uh, which is a different company, continued development of a fresh, uh, which is a technosphere insulin uh, inhaled powder. And that's recently been approved um, in about June of 2014, Afresia um, was approved, and it's an ultra-rapid acting real-time inhaled insulin for adults with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Um, it's not recommended in patients who smoke or have recently stopped smoking, so within six months, or um, anyone who has lung disease, so asthma or COPD, uh, because of concerns of acute bronchospasm. They are looking at um, Afresia specifically in this population in a trial, but that data uh, isn't currently available. So they are um, saying that we should not use this in um, patients who have lung disease. So before initiating therapy, um, they recommend performing a detailed medical history, physical exam, and then also checking FEV1 at baseline, regardless of whether or not they um, you know, complain of any sort of lung symptoms. And then a repeat FEV1 should be assessed after the first six months of therapy and then annually thereafter, even, again, in the absence of any lung symptoms. The um, inhaled insulin is administered using single inhalation per cartridge, um, and they have these single-use cartridges that are available in four or eight units at the beginning of a meal. So the Technosphere technology um, is a drug delivery platform that allows for long administration of drugs based on um, fumaril dikidopeperazine molecule into microparticles. And so the human regular insulin is loaded onto this dikidopeperazine molecule for inhalation. So it allows for rapid uh, delivery and absorption via the lungs. And this graph shows um, sort of the phar pharmacokinetics of Afresia, this ultra-rapid acting insulin. And it's called ra ultra-rapid acting insulin as opposed to just rapid acting insulin um, because of the onset and peak. So in people with diabetes, um, the early insulin response is lost. So that first phase of insulin secretion is lost. Um, and this sort of dotted chartreuse line here shows this is what happens in normal non-diabetic individuals. The rapid acting analogs, you know, so the traditional subcutaneous insulin injections that we have, or regular, which is short acting insulin that we have, really doesn't come close to mimicking sort of human physiology. Um, and so a lot of times we can see patients who have quite high postprandial um, glycemic excursions. With Afresia, it, again, most closely mimics um, sort of physiology in non-diabetic individuals, and so you get a much quicker peak in about 14 minutes um, compared to um, some of the more traditional subcutaneous insulin injections that we have. So it does 
decrease A1C, um, and in this particular study, it was a 12-week 12, 12 study, um, and compared to uh, placebo. So they just had the texnosphere particles without the insulin versus with the inhaled insulin. And there was um, a uh, significant decrease in overall A1C reduction, which you, you would expect since it is an insulin therapy. Um, and it had more of an impact on those who had uh, moderate to severe A1C elevations. It really seems to impact more of the postprandial glycemic excursions, like I had mentioned. So after someone eats and their food is peaking, um, it seems to reduce that the most. The other thing is the hypoglycemia rates actually weren't um, particularly high. Um, Again, this is the placebo column here and the technosphere insulin column here. And they're pretty similar as far as rates of hypoglycemia. And I should mention that the individuals in the study were on oral anti-diabetic drugs, so, um, and they added on the inhaled insulin. Um, and so the rate of hypoglycemia is pretty comparable. Um, and then the other attractive thing about um, inhaled aphrasia is that, you know, people didn't really gain weight on it, at least in this study. Um, some of the other studies, they did gain a small amount of weight, but less than you expect with sort of the traditional subcutaneous um, insulin therapy that we have. So it does seem to have a more favorable weight profile um, as well as hypoglycemia profile compared to the usual subcutaneous insulin therapies. Um, the other thing, though, to keep in mind because of its route of administration is the effects on the pulmonary function test. And this is a uh, relatively new drug, and we don't have a lot of long-term data on this. Uh, cough, these beyond just effects on pulmonary function tests, other sort of um, pulmonary side effects like cough, bronchospasm, um, potentially can be seen. So what about lung cancer? Because there's been all this controversy about diabetes medications and cancer risk. Um, well, the incidence of lung cancer in those on the technosphere insulin in clinical studies um, was consistent with the rate expected in sort of the general diabetes population. Um, and they had sort of non-smokers and ex-smokers. Um, to evaluate, however, the long-term risk of lung cancer, they're looking to do a post-marketing observational cohort trial, um, looking uh, essentially at the incidence of primary pulmonary malignancies in those using this inhaled insulin. Um, they'll also look at other malignancies um, except for non-melanoma skin cancers, um, as well as other potentially adverse events. Uh, and the idea is to enroll about 1,800 patients and follow them for at least five years to get this information. So we don't have this information at this time. So we don't really know as far as longer term effects. So the dosing is a little bit different than the traditional subcutaneous insulin. Um, this is the dose conversion table. And the nominal dose of aphrasia is a little different than the actual dose that you get. And so um, that's why the aphrasia dose is sort of on the upper end compared to the injected insulin dose here. And again, it comes in these four unit or eight unit blue or green cartridges respectively um, for individual inha inhalation for dosing. This just shows um, a picture of what, it, what the inhaler looks like. So it's much smaller than um, the Exubro in, inhaled insulin um, inhaler, the one that didn't do so well back in 2006 and 2007. So this one's much more um, pocket-sized and easier to carry around. Oops, sorry. Um, it just shows here that this is where, this is where the insulin cartridge goes. This is this removable mouthpiece, and then you just sort of put in the cartridge and snap it shut. Um, what's the cost? Um, commercial pharmacy cost out of pocket is about $350 uh, for about a 30-day supply, depending on how much you're actually using. 
Um, there's a copay card if you have commercial insurance. So if you don't have insurance, then you're kind of out of luck. So, um, but the copay card is uh, that you won't pay more than thirty dollars, and there are various stipulations there. So it's not cheap, um, but it is a different formulation of the insulin that we currently have available. Um, and this is sort of the packaging here. It comes with two inhalers, and then you've got these cartridges um, and these blisters, and there are like five blisters with three cartridges each, so you get like 15 uh, per foil pack, um, packaging. So other things that are available include um, a newer, uh, a new concentrated insulin that again was just recently FDA approved. Um, just as a reminder, we have sort of the old <coughs> concentrated U500 insulin um, that's been in use and we use in these in individuals who are requiring upwards of two to three hundreds of units of insulin a day. Um, Tracebo or insulin degludec is U200 that uh, there was a lot of hype about it kind of around 2013 that would be approved but it actually was turned down by the FDA because they wanted additional cardiac safety studies and so that is not currently approved in the US but is available in Europe and then more recently February of 2015 we have U300 Glargine or 2JO um, available and on a unit-to-unit -unit basis, 2JO has a lower blood, glu blood glucose lowering effect than Lantus, which is U100 glargine. Um, there were higher fasting prandial glucose levels in the first weeks of therapy when individuals changed over from Lantus. Um, because of sort of the onset of action and the time it takes to reach steady state. So it doesn't kick in for six hours. and um, you don't want to too quickly adjust therapy, so they recommend that you wait at least a good five days before you consider adjusting the dose. And this is just the pharmacokinetic profile. So it tends to be a little flatter than even Lantus as far as the um, profile. So potentially a little less hypoglycemia even than Lantus does, um, or the Glargine U100 does. So Zutolfi is an injectable combination therapy of ultra-long-acting insulin degludec, again, the one that's not approved here in the U.S., and injectable liraglutide, which is um, a GLP-1 receptor agonist, uh, currently a approved therapy here in the U.S. for treatment of diabetes. And so they've combined this into um, a pre-filled pen um, for once daily injection in people with type 2 diabetes. It's approved in Europe because insulin degludec is approved in Europe, but not approved in the US, again, because of the insulin degludec component. Um, but just to show you it, compared to insulin degludec or liraglutide alone, the combination therapy has greater A1C lowering effect. Um, similar to um, here compared to placebo, it has um, A1C lowering effects, as you can see there, by about maybe you know, half a percent to one percent A1C decline um, when compared to placebo, and then here, I'm sorry, about one to one and a half percent A1C decline compared to placebo, um, and maybe a little bit more um, here because the individual started at a higher A1C level. There's also decreased hypoglycemia rate uh, compared to um, insulin degludec, the combination therapy is, has less uh, hypoglycemia. Uh, glucagon is another therapy um, that, you know, is important in treatment of hypoglycemia and diabetes. But currently, the formulation that it's in is a little inconvenient. You have to mix the formulation, um, and that wastes time, potentially, to treat someone who has hypoglycemia. So, Xeris is a company that makes glucagon, and they're working on um, developing a premix glucagon formulation in different formulations. Um, as far as different uh, packaging. Um, and just to show you, so they're working on glucagon that can go through the insulin pumps, like with the biotic pancreas that we had talked about previously. And they're also working on um, sort of individual mini pins that people can self-inject um, glucagon if needed and more individualized doses rather than sort of the one dose fits all emergency kit that we currently prescribe. 
researchers at MIT are working on potentially a hidden needle concept of insulin delivery. So with the idea that you swallow a pill and there are hollow needles that can inject the insulin directly into the stomach lining um, once the outer coating is dissolved. This is really still in its infancy, but it could be another way that we could deliver insulin beyond subcutaneous and now inhaled insulin therapies that are available. Um, there's a subcutaneous mini pump that's implantable that's about the size of a matchstick uh, that can potentially deliver uh, continuous doses of exenatide, which is a GLP-1 receptor agonist, um, and could be implanted once or twice a year compared to the current formulations that we have where it's once a week injection or twice a day or once a day injections. So this is currently in phase three trials. So in conclusion, um, I've really only kind of highlighted some of a few things, a few therapies um, currently that are available and potentially are in the pipeline um, in the near future and maybe a little longer um, as far as treatment tools and diabetes management. The current new therapies that we have may minimize you know, unwanted hazards of diabetes therapy like hypoglycemia, which is certainly a risk in insulin therapy. But you know, affordability is always a big issue, um, I think, especially in our patient population. Um, and it can often limit treatment options. But at least you know, there are potentially these tools that are available. Um, neurodiabetes therapies uh, can have positive impact in diabetes outcomes. But it's important to remember that diabetes is still an ever-increasing problem. And prevention is still um, important in the fight against diabetes. So, thank you.